This is Emily. Emily was murdered last night with two suspects. The first says he was never there. The second says he visited, but he left before anything happened. Now the forensics team collected DNA from the crime scene, from Emily, and from the two suspects. And what they found out may be the key to cracking this case. And a little hint, the DNA was not Emily's. This is DNA profiling, where silent evidence becomes almost irrefutable evidence when trying to justify incriminating someone. It turns suspicion into certainty. DNA profiling allows scientists to identify and compare individuals using short tandem repeats, which are abbreviated to STRs. STRs are genetic markers that vary between individuals. They are short DNA sequences, usually two to five bases long, that repeat in specific regions of your genome. Now the number of repeats is what makes each person's genetic profile unique. For example, at one STR locus, Bob might have the sequence CAG repeated 20 times on one chromosome and 10 times on the other. This genotype is said to be 2010. Whereas James might have eight repeats on both chromosomes and his genotype is 88. These differences, like a genetic barcode, help us to tell people apart like Bob and James. Now to do this, number one, scientists use PCR to amplify certain STR regions. Now how they do this is that they use primers that bind to specific regions before an STR so that you're only amplifying the STRs. Number two, the amplified STR regions are then separated by size using gel electrophoresis. Number three, scientists observe the pattern of bands on the gel that reflects the length of the STR regions. So the shorter fragments are gonna move faster faster and further through the gel, whereas the longer fragments are going to move more slowly and they don't travel as far, so they stay closer to the wells. In real forensic cases, scientists test around 13 to 20 STR regions. This is so that the odds of two completely unrelated people having the same STR profile is roughly one in a billion. Now going back to the case, let's analyze our gel and see whose genetic profile matches. So here we can see the length of each fragment based on its distance from the well. So like we said before, the heavier fragments don't move as far, whereas the lighter fragments move further. Now the main thing we want to look at is whose genetic profile matches the DNA found at the crime scene. And that is suspect two. The DNA found at the crime scene matched perfectly with suspect two, with the same band pattern. But this is the same suspect who claimed that they were never there. So do we trust what the suspect said? Or do we trust the irrefutable evidence that their DNA was found at the crime scene? Well, there was a similar case in 2009 when Farah Jama was convicted of rape based solely on a DNA match. There was no motive, no witnesses, and no memory of him from the victim. After 15 months in prison, it was revealed that a forensic technician accidentally processed Farah's swab in the same lab on the same day as the victim's crime scene sample. His DNA contaminated the evidence. Now you can see that DNA profiling is powerful. It should be used as evidence, just not the only evidence. But DNA profiling isn't only for criminal cases. It can also be used for paternity and maternity testing, identifying disaster victims, and monitoring genetic diversity in endangered populations. Anyway guys, so that is basically DNA profiling. Next video, we are gonna be talking about DNA sequencing and the difference between DNA profiling and DNA sequencing. So keep a look for next week's video.